We are hearing a great deal at the present day of the liberty which we ought to extend to our Catholic brethren. Liberty. A whole lot of liberty, huh? Yeah. It would be well if we knew a little more of the kind of liberty which they propose to extend to us as soon as they have power. Who's the day? Who's the day? The Jesuit order. The Jesuit order. Every concession to Catholics, whether that concession be small or great, is hastening the day when they can carry out the plan of which the Jesuits at the present day have so boldly and openly approved. Let us hear no more. Let us hear no more then of the Jesuits as the benefactors of mankind, as amiable gentlemen who merit our consideration like uh, Hale Obama uh, did in that one video on the channel here, not even a minute long, I don't think it is, where he praises the Jesuits. Uh-huh. Yeah. Let it be noted that we make no doubtful or calumnious charge against them. What we have advanced are stern facts. And facts which should sink deep into the heart of every reader. Nor can the matter be referred to the past. Refered, excuse me, refer, ref, referred to the past, excuse me. Meaning that's what they used to be. That's not how it is nowadays. You're right in a sense because they're worse today. Romanists are very anxious to persuade us that the age of persecution and intolerance has passed. Oh yeah, and they give you a toilet paper like Vatican II with the ecumenical nonsense. Okay, yeah. It has not passed. And those who say this know that well. And those who say that are usually the ones that are the leaders feeding you, the people. Here is the proof that Rome is as intolerant, as narrow, as cruel, and as determined to exterminate Englishmen, and today we can put this in context to everybody who doesn't bow down to them, we do to even use the word Protestants as ever she was in the darkest ages of her dark career if they do not accept her creed. The Jesuits must know that they have hope of success or they would never have made their plans public. It was a daring act. But they are daring men. Hmm. It would be well if we knew a little more of this kind of the kind of liberty which they propose to extend to us as soon as they have power. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 19, on to verse 22. <laughs> While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge, just the knowledge, just the mental ascent, no conversion, no brokenness, no contrition, no fear of the Lord, just a mental consent, okay? 
For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. The old saying, ignorance is bliss, right? Hmm? See, for an example, the law that you hear that some Christians tell you that you got to keep the commandments today in order to be saved, stay saved, or be right with God. Okay? God's perfect requirements, the Ten Commandments, which man at his best, ca uh, at his best state could never keep. That's the whole point. To show you your inadequacy. See? Okay? And then you discover... Isn't that appropriate? Can you hear that? Sirens? Go figure. And then you come around, then a saint comes to you and informs you of truth. And you have a knowledge. But you choose to reject the truth and hold on to a knowledge, just a head knowledge, without it descending the 18 inches from here to here. Hmm. For it had been better for them to not, not to have known the way of righteousness. And see, here's the thing. There ain't no innocent person in hell. There ain't. Okay? There isn't one innocent person in hell. Not one. There's not one person in hell who's going to be at the great white throne of judgment saying... What, 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 I, I, you know, that's, that's the, that's the heresy of these filthy Calvinists that say, yes, God has selected certain people to go to hell, no ifs, ands, or buts. That's not true. That's a lie. Okay, that's a lie. All right? There's no innocent people in hell. Not one. In one way and or another, sometime, at some point in your life, you were presented the truth. What you do with it? What did you do with it? Or did you want to hold on to your own mental ascent? What did you do with it? And see, no one is going to go without knowing. You might say, well, what about children, the babies and stuff like that? Uh, a child, before he or she, there's only two genders, reaches the age where they can understand, where they can gravitate, okay, and get the gravity of the enormity of what it means that they are sinners against God. Okay? All right? It's referred to as the age of accountability. And people like to dispute that. It's, it's bizarre. It's bizarre. It, it is bizarre. It is bizarre that people like to dispute that. There is no set in stone age of accountability. It is when the child, dependent on the Lord and on the child himself, that the child will able to be able to understand the weight of what it means to be like, Hey, I'm a sinner against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. I am doing contrary to what the Lord has said. And because I'm doing contrary to what the Lord has said, His wrath is against me. Okay? I have known 18-year-olds, or excuse me, known of 18-year-olds, who still couldn't grasp that. Fortunately, I have known, what was it, 12 or 13-year-olds who have already gone through uh, a life of suffering that most of us in our lifetimes will never experience. You know, that they grow up quick. It's like, well, what kind of childhood did you have? Short. You know? And they grow up quickly. That is possible. That is possible. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. 
And see, no one is going to be without excuse. You're not going to, you're without excuse. Okay? Like it says in the book of Romans. Hold your place here and go to Romans chapter 1. Let's refresh our memories of that truth. Okay? Romans chapter 1, verses 19, on to verse 22. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Because you are made in the image of God. Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath shewed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, see, there's that mental ascent there. There's the mental ascent. That's, and that's, that's what most of these people, they, they have it here. It doesn't go down here. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. How, how do you glorify God as God? That's, that's a no-brainer. Do what he says. Okay? Walk according to the dictates of Scripture for us today and for our instruction and in righteousness found in the Old Testament. Okay? Because remember, dear friend, remember. Okay? Romans chapter 12. As saints... 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. How do you learn how to do that? Through uh, searching the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Okay, it's not that difficult to figure out on how to do it. The actual doing of it, though. And be not conformed to this world. Conformity. Hmm. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Who are you proving it to? Who are you proving it to? Oh, you can give these you can give some of these people all the evidence of scripturally and your responses by you know, demonstrating, the Lord demonstrating himself through you, a vessel meet for his use, and people still won't get it. See, they will be without excuse. They will be without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark, and professing themselves to be wise. They became fools, and the fool says in his heart, there is no God. And in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Well, they promised them liberty. <laughs> liberty. The liberty to live in sin. The liberty to conform to a Jesuitical controlled government that has its own interests in mind. And we, mankind, are to be the food to bring up the stuff onto the pyramid structure. Remember? The pyramid structure. Okay, the pyramid structure. All right? The pyramid structure, the instructions come down from the head, which is one, Arturo Sosa, inevitably to be that man of sin, the son of perdition. That's after we get out of here. Okay? But it stems from one, Arturo Sosa, and it goes down to the broad base, infecting all things. But also, when it comes to the prophet, not the prophet, the prophet of that. The bottom base rises up to the top. And the bottom base is 
quite, uh, you know, quite larger than the top. So all that stuff goes up to the top, over flooding it. With what? Men, riches, wealth, dignity, right? Power. Power. You know, it's kind of incumbent <laughs> upon me to make a mention of this. A, a dear, dear brother and friend who's we're overdue with speaking, brother. Well, overdue with speaking on a lot of the brethren. They're busy. But anyway, no excuses. But brother sent me a video which um, <laughs> talking about what possibly could happen this month. Now, you've all heard it in one way or another that they're going to bring back the lockdowns and that the, uh, they're going to bring back this, that, and the other thing. And you got to remember, okay, what happened, what was it, uh, what, going on now three, four years ago? Okay, they never got rid of it, did they? Oh, sure, they distract you through the media with other things like the Johnny Depp trial. <laughs> And stuff like that. And sports and whatever. They distract you. Well, see, it's the sleight of hand thing. They got something going on over here. But all the while they're working under here. They have your attention here. But all the while under here. They're able to do all this stuff, right? They never got rid of it. They never got rid of it. They didn't push it to the forefront. But they never got rid of it. It was always looming, lurking there. To be brought back. For another time just like the Napoleon Bonaparte thing and interesting I found out while looking on YouTube the one day that the Joker is now going to be playing Napoleon Bonaparte how how appropriate how appropriate you got chump in the news and they're just doing whatever to him and uh, if if the Jesuit order selects Trump and put him back in office. He is going to be the downfall. Listen, my country. Have you can't you can't figure it? What's, what what is it with y'all? You patriots, okay? You patriots. <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting when you look into these American patriots of today. I liken it onto the comparison of the. The yuppie individual who does his thing on the weekdays, but on the weekends he puts on his motorcycle jacket, he puts on his headband and gets his uh, Harley Davidson out of the garage and sports around as if he's someone. And then the ghost rider or the Mongol, you know, those choice individuals look at this guy who's a weekend warrior and it's like... <laughs> That's the only kind of comparison I could compare it to, so beg your pardon. But see, you got these people who are these American patriots. Hmm. For what? For what? For what end? So they can indulge in their sin? Hmm? Or they, they want to make America, they want to bring back America to what it once was. And there is this incredibly grotesque delusion that America was a godly nation. A godly nation. Oh. America was never a godly nation, people. The mercy that America has received is because the church, the saints of the living God dwell within this nation and there's still work for the Lord to be done okay that's the only reason why any mercy has been extended to this country America as a concept was doomed within the first 13 states uh, there is that book that I have uh, recommended on to you before uh, this one right here I've rec I, I still to this day, I highly recommend this book to you. 
Okay, I highly recommend, any of you my countrymen, I highly recommend this book to you. This is a fascinating book about the first, the original 13 states, okay? And, um, you know, uh, this American Masonic idea was doomed by the time you have Maryland. It was doomed. It was doomed. And now, like I said, they have Trump in the news, pushing him, and I'm telling you, I'm telling you people, I'm warning you, if they select Trump, because you, your votes mean nothing, you mean nothing, you're just fodder to the Jesuits, okay? You have to accept that and realize that, okay? If they select Trump, Trump and put him back in office. It's going to be worse than ever. And I believe, I believe that as the Jesuits used Napoleon Bonaparte to sacrifice his people so that to get rid of the true patriots, that's what Trump's going to do if they select him. You people are being deceived, thinking that if they put Trump in office, things are going to get better. It's not going to get better. It's just going to get, get worse. It's going to, if they select Trump and put him in office, okay, it's going to be worse than it is now. You have to understand that, my friends. You have to understand that. And I know what we're talking about is kind of excluding you of other nations. I, I apologize for that. You know, it's like our one brother, if, uh, if, uh, if he ever is put into ministry, you know, he's going to be concentrating on his nation as well when it comes to this kind of stuff. I mean, of course, he, the Lord will use him to uh, feed the body of Christ because that's what we're supposed to do. But it's like he's going to be this like, hey, you know, I can, I'm in my own nation. My own nation's got its problems. And, you know, if the Lord raises him up to be a voice unto his people, that's what he's going to do. Okay? You know? But there's, there are things you can learn from this, brother. Okay? Let's address this thing. Let's briefly address this thing of patriotism. Patriotism. You know, as a lost, lost sodomite man, I had long hair. I had my, my long hair was down to here, okay? I had really long hair. I was a, it was a mess. I was just a mess. But for a long time, I worked as cook in the Woodstock VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars. And I gotta tell you something. I always took the time to sit and to speak with some of these veterans from World War II. The uh, baby boomer um, generation, I believe they're called. I believe they're called, okay? And it was always kind of an odd thing because, um, go to Jeremiah chapter 29, by the way. Uh, because here I was, a long-haired, you know, sodomite, talking to these men, these veterans of World War II, and listening to their stories. Listening to their stories of what they went through and what they believed they fought for. Okay? What they believed they fought for. Have you ever done that, taking the time to listen to some of these older gentlemen? from that period. I mean, it's disappearing now because they're dying off. But I always did that. I always, I, I always did that. And if you've never had the chance to listen to some of these older gentlemen from the World War II era, um, it's, it, they were a totally, a totally different people than what you are encountering today. Totally different. But they, had, they believed in something. They believed in something, and they believed in this, okay? They did. But see, you also have to remember, dear friend, that America, America was doomed from the start. Okay? 
remember, our ancestry here in America was from Calvinistic Puritans who came here escaping persecution from the Church of England, i.e. Rome as well. Okay? All right? They come here, and yet you have one of the 13 original states, Maryland. It was, it was, it was doomed. It was shot. It was shot by then. And then, of course, what happened? The Civil War. The Civil War. The 14th Amendment. But even more so prominent, the sinking of the Titanic. Some of you guys are rolling your eyes. Oh, Brad. Go. You know, there was some, there's been some people who are, who are saints who once, you know, believed that truth that, yes, the Jesuit order did that, but they're like, no, nah, that's just conspiracy. You, you guys are crazy. You guys are crazy. Okay? Yes, the Jesuit order sank the Titanic. Brad, it hit an iceberg. Yeah, I know. Listen. One way or another, that ship was going to go down. It just so happened it was uh, they had a convenient iceberg field to go through and smash it into. Okay? That ship, the Titanic, was going to sink. Whether it was by the boiler fire that is very kind of hush-hush, but is, is a fact well known that it buckled the paint and, and stuff like that at the port. Okay, whether it was that or some other measure, that ship was going to sink. One way or another, okay? Why am I bringing that up? What happened after the sinking of the Titanic and all those who withstood the Federal Reserve? What happened? The Federal Reserve Bank came into existence here in America, which is the Pope's personal bank, the bank of the Jesuit order, okay? And because of that, what happens? Look, from what, 1912 and 1913, when the, um, the Federal Reserve came into existence here in America? Look what happened! Look at the departure from what Samuel Morse warned about. What uh, people before that warned about. What happened? America since then has been involved in war after war after war after war. Being used as the bulldog, as it were, of the Jesuit order. And now America is a laughing stock and one of the most, if not the most, hated nation on earth. Our military has been diluted, okay? You, you, you ex-military. You can verify that. Okay? All right? America has been used as a menstrual cloth by the Jesuit order. Soon to be discarded. And it, it baffles me when some of you, you know, it's like, Brad, you're too hard on America. Listen to me. America cannot be saved. There's no coming back to anything, any semblance of what America might have been, what some people remember it to be. It's not going to happen. You have to understand that. Okay? This nation is so far gone that it cannot be reclaimed. You have to understand that. Well, what happens? See, the, the Christianity of today, which is controlled by the Jesuit order, comes to you and tries to use scripture to justify submission to a government that is run by the Jesuit order. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 on to verse 14. Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders which were carried away captives and to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that, Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. 
by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent unto Babylon, sent unto Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Very important verse there. Because this is, okay, talking about, you know, captivity. Okay? He caused them to go there. All right? They are in captivity because of the sins of Jerusalem. Okay? What does he say to these people who are in captivity in a foreign land not their own. Build ye houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. What? Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that ye may be increased there and not diminished. Ah, the remnant that you may increase and not be diminished, not be wiped out. Okay? Verse 7 And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. For, this is a very important verse, for in the peace thereof. Ye shall have peace. Hold your place here and go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Verses 1 on to verse 8. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Hmm. For kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead, that we may lead, we, the body of Christ, may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Godliness and honesty. To what end? To what end, though? Well, that's simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, verses 18 on to verse 20. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed to us his body, the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So, we are to pray that we may have, what is this? Back in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. For kings and for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. As ambassadors for Christ. So that these lost people may behold us. Our conversation. Our actions. Our works. That we may be a testimony unto them. Just like in Deuteronomy chapter 4, how Israel was taken out of Egypt and established to be the beacon, to be the example of God's grace, of God's law, of God's judgment. The uh, Israel in the Old Testament times was the equivalent of what the church of the living God is to be today. They were to be the example. They were to be the light, as it were. Okay? Back under the Old Testament, if someone wanted to be right with God, they had to go through the Hebrew. Okay? They had to go to the law. Today, you want to be right with God, you got to go the way of the cross. You see how that works? That is why 
we pray that, Lord, please keep these Jesuits away from us. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty as ambassadors for Christ, having the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation so we may be ambassadors, so we can be vessels made for the master's use. And that don't matter in what nation under heaven you're in. Okay? There ain't no such thing as a godly government today. There isn't. Well, God has put these people in power. You're right, for judgment. For judgment. You're right. You're right. You're right. Okay? Let's continue here. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have only the Calvinists, <clears throat> excuse me, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. But then again, remember, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to come to him the way he has prescribed. Too many like to boot the door out of the way and climb up some other way. Okay? All right, and what do we read to verse 8? Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles and faith in verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, and doubting. Meaning what? Go back to Jeremiah. Verse 7 again. And seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. Why? So we can lead a quiet and peaceable godly life as ambassadors for Christ. So that the Lord may be glorified. That he may save those who he is going to save. Okay? All right? Let's continue in Jeremiah, uh, verse 8. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, saying, Peace, peace. And there is no peace. Neither hearken to your dreams, which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Christianity is not the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Okay? You're going to hear these Christians if they decide to bring back all these things. Because, you know, think about it. Think about it. Like it says here, this, by the way, Black Pope by M.F. Cusack. I've, re I've read this to you before. Oh, I highly recommend this book. Okay? The Jesuits must know that they have hope of success or they would never have made their plans public. It was a daring act, but they are daring men. Okay? Uh, last month, you were seeing a lot of, oh, how they're going to bring back all this stuff and all this stuff is going to happen. They're going to bring back the lockdowns. As I saw on Google today, you know, just looking on my cell phone, uh, they talk about a government shutdown. That government shutdown doesn't generally affect us people who, you know, are barely getting by. It usually affects other people. I mean, really, it does. But think about it. You've seen here on YouTube. Are you ready? They're going to bring back the lockdowns. What if they do? Think about the chutzpah. Think about the chutzpah that entails. Think about that. Think about that. That the Jesuits are so bold knowing that they're going to succeed. Why? Because a nation has been so subverted <laughs> that they are willing to believe that the white that they see is black as if their superior so orders them to believe it. Hmm. That's part of the Jesuit credo. People have been so subverted to believe anything. Why do you think why do you think the Jesuits can get away with, with 
nonsense that they're getting away with. Hmm? But what if they did? What if they do? This month. Huh? This month. They were talking about, oh, October. What if they do? What if they do? Let's finish up here in Jeremiah chapter 14, uh, 29, okay? Jeremiah chapter 29, picking up at verse 10. We're reading on to verse 14. Now this is talking, another dispensation, of course. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. And of course, that's talked about in um, Ezra and Nehemiah and stuff like that, okay? And here's, here's a verse, a couple of verses that Christianity takes way out of context to puff you up, okay? To puff you up, not build you up, but to puff you up. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go, and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me, and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all nations, you know, from the diaspora, talking about the Jews, okay? And from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place where I have caused you to be carried away captive. This is specifically referencing for the Hebraic Jewish people. Okay? You and I as a church of the living God, our destination is fixed. Okay? It's fixed. All right? But what if they do? What if they do bring this stuff back? What if they do? We as saints, Isaiah chapter 37, Isaiah chapter 37, verses 14 on to verse 20. Isaiah chapter 37, verses 14 on to verse 20. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up unto the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed unto the Lord, saying, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. <laughs> Incline thine ear, O Lord, and hear. Open thine eyes, O Lord, and see, and hear all the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent to reproach the living God of a truth. Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord, even thou only. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now you and I as saints, we're not afraid. But they are. And see, what happened, see, the whole structure of what happened is, a couple of years ago when they imposed all that nonsense, the psychological operation imposed by the Jesuit order, it hardened people. It made people weary. And with all the woke nonsense, and with all the stupidity, and all these things, the subversion that has been getting worse and worse and worse uh, in this nation, it is driving people to the point of snapping. Okay? Kind of like shell shock, where you receive way too much input, and that you're on the verge of collapse. Breaking. Okay? Breaking. Hence, one of the best ways to destroy a nation is from within, so that it pulls itself apart. And if they do, do I think they're going to impose it back again like it was a couple of years ago? I don't really know. 
they they obviously could because they have they've reserved that just in case just in case okay they have but even if they do we as saints second timothy chapter 1 verses 7 under verse 14 for god hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. The true gospel. Okay? Brethren, it is time. It has been. You have to take a stand for something. Stand! <laughs> stand! Go to go. Uh, uh, what is that? Um, Ephesians. Yeah, go to Ephesians six. Go to Ephesians six. Okay. <laughs> Verses thirteen. On to verse twenty. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand. Therefore having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, knowing where we're going to go when we die, knowing that we are saved, okay? And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereon too, and watching thereon too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that there that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Stand. Stand, brethren. Stand. Back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 8. Be not, there, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us. The helmet. Okay? And called us with the holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Yes, because he chose the way of the cross. Okay? God is a God who chooses. Okay? But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Why? For I know whom I have believed, whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. We ought to be able to move forward with the confidence, unless the Lord sends a check, because he's able to do that, you know, um, that we are doing his will, that we are in his will, that we are his will. Have you ever considered that? That as a saint, you are, you are the will of God? Isn't that something? What's the hold up with some of y'all? Hold fast the form, the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which, which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us and the Lord is that spirit. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So, now hold on. Now hold up here. Hold up here. Okay. 
We are to pray for our nation that we may have peace so that we may do the work of the Lord. Okay? That, that's the point. That, that's the point of it all. That we may be ambassadors for Christ. But what happens if they impose things that are totally against Scripture, that are against the Lord? What do we do? Christianity will have you submit to silence you. So, on whom should your patriotism be? This, and it's sad, because many people died by wars started by someone else. Sound familiar? By Rome. But they haven't died in vain. They haven't. So, where should your patriotism truly be, my friend? Why defend any more a nation that is owned by the Vatican, but rather pray for a nation that we as saints may continue until the very end to live and to preach the gospel. Now, Hezekiah, upon threats, upon hearing these things, did only the only thing he could truly do, lay it before the Lord. Go now to Isaiah 36. Isaiah 36. Let's read a little about the backstory here. Isaiah 36. Isaiah 36. Verses 4 and verse 22. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I say, sayest thou, but they are vain words. Well, kind of like Pharaoh said in the presence of Moses and Aaron about how they were regarding vain words, thus saith the Lord. See, Pharaoh is calling the words of the Lord vain words. Yea, hath God said? I say, sayest thou, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Yeah, because the Lord is our strength. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Check this out. Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt, whereon if a man lean it will go into his hand and pierce it, so is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. And he's talking about, of course, how at this time Egypt was a kind of like a base kingdom. Okay? It's interesting that Egypt, in accordance to scripture, has never regained any kind of dominance as a kingdom ever since. Hmm, isn't that something? And of course, scripturally, for our instruction in righteousness today, Egypt is likened onto a type of the world and Pharaoh as onto a type of Satan. And it's interesting that with verse 6, Lo, thou trustest in the staff of this broken reed on Egypt. Hmm. Hmm. Whereon, if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. Hmm. Like the piercings of a serpent. Like the, the viper that latched on Paul's hand, which came out the fire, a fire, right? Okay? So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all that trust in him. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses. Yeah, but don't look to the Lord their God. Ouch. Okay? Check this out. Check this out. Now, check this out. Seriously. But if thou say to me, we trust in the Lord God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away 
and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, Ye shall worship before this altar. Hold up! Wait a minute. What did Hezekiah do? He took away all the false idols. He took away the, 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 the false altars. He took away the heresy. And here comes Rabshakeh, representing the king of Assyria. Assyria, um, successful enemy, or, or victorious enemy, I believe that means. Uh, someone can correct me later. But this guy's coming along saying, But if thou say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away? No, Brad, you're, you're not a saved man because you're against Christianity. You're right, I am against Christianity. I'm a saved man. But you're right, I am against Christianity because it's not the faith that was once delivered to the saints. But see, what does Christianity do? Aren't, you're trying to remove all the things. Aren't these what God has set up? Like what, the church buildings? Huh? You see? See, this guy, as we're going to see, is claiming to be coming in the name of the very Lord who the Jews trust on here in this context. He's, he's going to be claiming to come and be coming in the name of the Lord, but yet we see in verse 7 that he's attributing unto the Lord the false idols. Let's continue. Now, therefore, give pledges, I pray thee. Give me your money. <laughs> yeah. Now, therefore, give pledges, pledges, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria. And I will give thee 2,000 horses, if thou be able on thy part to set riders on them. If you will fall down and worship me, all will be yours. Just give me yourself. Give me your mind. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Verse 10. Look at this. Don't look at me. Look at this. And am I now come up without the Lord against the, this land to destroy it? Oh boy. The Lord has said unto me, Go up against this land and to destroy it. He's claiming, he's claiming to be coming in the name of the very Lord who the Jews, the Hebrews, are trusting on. Who he just said in verse 7 about how Hezekiah tore down the altars. The fake, the false. Oh, well, you know what this reminds me of? John chapter 16. John chapter 16, verses 1 on verse 3. Verses, uh, John, John chapter 16, verses 1 on verse 3. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. You know, years ago when the Jesuits were in full swing with their psychological operation, Christianity, look at what they did. They shut down. Okay? And the sacred calf. You know, there is a sacred calf, especially here on some of these social platforms, that you dare not touch, you know. For example, you know, the, the steel of the Jesuit poniard, okay. That's one of the sacred calves. You dare not speak against it. Why? Because aren't these people, you know, uh, how, uh, where is that? Verse 10 in, Jeremiah, uh, in Isaiah 36. Am, and am I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, go up against this land and destroy it. He's claiming that the Lord sent him. 
But yet remember in verse 7, he also said, has <laughs> Hezekiah taken away all the altars of the Lord? Now the Lord may well have been, it's like, allowed him to do that. Absolutely. Okay? But see, the problem is, he's claiming to serve the very God that the Hebrews are claiming, are trusting on. But he really isn't. And that's something. What's my point? My point is this. If they do bring back as some like Buddha, that Buddha guy, okay, um, propaganda kind of thing, and, and that's that's the thing too. We got to remember, brethren. It is very possible that they may bring all these things back, but the propaganda of it, the fear mongering of it, we have nothing to fear, and we saints know that. But see, the point is to get you people to revolt so that we tear each other apart and so that maybe the government might have an excuse. See how this is working out? You see? Even if they do, we saints have nothing to fear. But see, it's going to be brought to a point to where it's going to be so severe if they do, and, and things are going to happen, it's inevitable. But if they bring, especially this month, like people have been saying, number one, that would be a chutzpah move if there ever was one. But everything is slighted to that way, isn't it? But if they do bring it back, like some of these guys have been talking about, you are going to see this Christianity submit even more so and be dictated by the dictates of the government. Worse than before. Hence, Rome, <coughs> in an attempt to make the faith that was once delivered unto the saints look laughable. Rome is going to, through Christianity, try to make the faith that was once delivered unto the saints look even more abhorrent. Christianity is going to be the mouthpiece of the upcoming whatever. I bet you. I'm not a betting man, but I bet you. I bet you. Worse than before. Christianity is going to be that vehicle. Especially if they select Trump. Okay? Especially if they select Trump. He's going to have like a Messiah complex if they select him, and it would be so appropriate, who has survived all this onslaught. It's, it's the, it's, you, I mean, Vince McMahon couldn't write a better story than this. Let's continue in Isaiah 36. Then said Eliakim, and Shebna, and Joah, unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, unto thy servants in the Syrian language, for we understand it. <clears throat> and speak not to us in the Jews' language, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. But Rabshakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? Denoting what? Starvation. Famine. Famine. Hmm. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. The Lord, and we already looked in Isaiah 37, verses 14 on to verse 20. Okay? You see how this is working? How he's operating? Number one, he's claiming to come in the name of the Lord. Okay, Rabshakeh, the king of Assyria. 
okay, guy, his, his ambassador. He's claiming to be coming in the name of the Lord. But yet, in the name of the Lord that he's claiming to be coming in are the very are represented by the altars and stuff that Hezekiah destroyed, which were all false. But yet he's claiming to speak for the true God. And yet right here he's saying again, neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. Oh boy. Verse 16. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, make an agreement with me by a present, and come unto me, come out to me, and eat ye every one of his vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his own cistern. Bow down to me, for this has all been given unto me, for whosoever I will, I give it. If you fall down and worship me, all will be thine. Bow down. Bow down to a government that's going to destroy you. Bow down to a government that in its makeup is contrary to the Lord. Bow down to it. Bow down to these nonsensical um, stipulations and regulations they may bring back. Bow down. Bow down, and all will be yours. I'm not saying, I am not saying anything like revolting or anything like that. What I am saying is, upon whom lies your patriotism? The Lord hasn't given us a spirit of fear. But who do we trust on? When our government says one thing, and our Lord says another thing, Christianity is going to say, you do what the government says. And they take out of context Romans 13 and 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Okay? They take that out of context, context, and they use that to try to, you know, badger you and to intimidate you. What do you do? What do you do? Well, let's finish this up here in Isaiah, in Isaiah okay? Verse 17. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods, little g, now see that? Little gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? A little uppity on himself, isn't he? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sepharvim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But they held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's commandment was saying, answer him not a word. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, that was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent and told the words of Rabshakeh. Psalm 94. Psalm 94. Verses 16 on to verse 23. America is in control. America is controlled by the Jesuit order. Okay? If you want to be patriotic, okay, 
patriotic. On to whom should it lie? On to whom should it be? Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. In the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee? Which frameth mischief by a law. Get a hold of that one there. Who frameth mischief by a law. They gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. But the Lord is my defense and my God is the rock of my refuge. And he shall bring upon them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14. 32 and verse 35. The wicked is driven away in his wickedness. But the righteous hath hope in his death. Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that hath understanding. Fear of the Lord. Uh, understanding. Departing from evil. But that which is in the midst of fools who say in their heart, there is no God, is made known. Righteousness exalteth the nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causes the shame. First Thessalonians chapter four. First Thessalonians chapter four. Verses thirteen on to verse eighteen. But I would not have you ignorant, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We don't know what's going to happen. But we can know this, brethren, that we have nothing to fear. We, we, we truly have nothing to fear. Because whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Okay? To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 again. Let's, let's finish up with this. Let's finish up with this. Because, okay. America has been subverted to the point to where if they bring back these things... It will probably cause some kind of revolt. Maybe. Who knows? But people are going to be so angry and so irate. It's going to take something extraordinary. But if they don't and just keep fear-mongering, then hey! But there is going to come, I believe, a certain event. What that is, I don't know. That's going to tip the scales. 
we very well could be here, brethren, to see the collapse and fall of America. Whatever nation you're in under heaven, you may be there to see the collapse and fall of your nation. It's very possible. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 on to verse 11, then we'll be done. For we know this, if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, our body, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Only saints will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Anyone else that's at the great white throne. Judgment seat of Christ is specifically for saved saints. Okay? that every one of us may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord that we're all going to give an account, saved and lost. We persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. There again, um, that we live a godly, peaceable life as ambassadors for Christ. Like I said, we, we, we don't know. It should be interesting if, if something happens or something like that. I don't know. I don't know. They, you know, you see here on YouTube, a lot of people, you know, pushing this thing about how they're going to bring that back, this, that, the other thing. You need the Lord's forgiveness. You need to be saved. Then let come what will. There, there is nothing wrong with being patriotic. There really isn't. You know? But what is the source of your patriotism? Is it for a nation that is ruled by the Jesuits? Or is it for the Lord Jesus Christ? Because, come on. Do any, I mean, and there are, there are. But, I mean, seriously, do you really think this is going to be made great again. Unfortunately, there are those of you, my countrymen, who do believe that. And I'm sorry you do believe that. It's going to be it for this little video. Like I said, I, I, had, I had to address this. This, this. this had to be addressed. Um, so, so that's what we did. Thank you for watching this. If you do... Thank you to all of you who pray for us and help us. Um, thank you. We love you. We'll see you in the next video, okay? Bye-bye.